Hi. Dorothy Sayers. I had heard that name. I was in the book business, so I knew that Dorothy Sayers was a famous name in mystery writing, British mysteries. And her name was nearly as famous between the two world wars as that of Agatha Christie. And some of you will have become familiar with Dorothy Sayers' writings, perhaps if you're if you're a habitual watcher of PBS mysteries, Lord Peter Whimsey mysteries were written by this lady, Dorothy Sayers. What's less well known and was not known to me, even when I was in the book business for quite a while, was that she was a famous Christian of that period and had was very outspoken in her Christianity, was a close friend of C.S. Lewis, among others, who was on a similar trajectory in the period between the wars. She was born in Oxford, though. That's one of the reasons she's connected to Lewis. Lewis was a Oxford Don before he became a Christian. They both specialized in medieval literature, by the way. She was the daughter of a clergyman in the Church of England. So she was raised in a Christian environment, but went through a period of rebellion in her teens and twenties, as is so common among people in the older mainstream religions. But Sayers was one of the first women to get a degree at Oxford. And later was when she came to Christian conviction in what seems to be the late twenties and early thirties, around the same time Lewis did, was outspoken in the media and got a lot of criticism in the press for her views. Uh, was viewed as kind of a dinosaur. Certainly among educated women was viewed as a dinosaur. So she wrote many of the essays contained in this little book, Creed or Chaos. She wrote many of these essays in response to criticism she received over the years that she was a very prominent literary figure, not just in Britain, but right across the world. And the first of the essays in this book is called The Greatest Drama Ever Staged. And this is what Dorothy Sayers has to say about the greatest drama ever staged is the official creed of Christendom. Official Christianity of late years has been having what is known as a bad press. We are constantly assured that the churches are empty because preachers insist too much upon doctrine, dull dogma, as people call it. The fact is the precise opposite. It is the neglect of dogma that makes for dullness. The Christian faith is the most exciting drama that ever staggered the imagination of man, and the dogma is the drama. That drama is summarized quite clearly in the creeds of the church, and if we think it dull, it is because we either have never really read those amazing documents, or have recited them so often and so mechanically as to have lost all sense of their meaning. The plot pivots upon a single character, and the whole action is the answer to a single central problem. What think ye of Christ? Before we adopt any of the unofficial solutions, some of which are indeed excessively dull, before we dismiss Christ as a myth, an idealist, a demagogue, a liar, or a lunatic, it will do no harm to find out what the creeds really say about him. What does the church think of Christ? The church's answer is categorical and uncompromising, and it is this, that Jesus bar Joseph, the carpenter of Nazareth, was in fact, and in truth, and in the most exact and literal sense of the words, the God by whom all things were made. His body and brain were those of a common man. His personality was the personality of God, so far as that personality could be expressed in human terms. He was not a kind of demon or fairy pretending to be human. He was in every respect a genuine living man. He was not merely a man so good as to be like God. He was God. Now, this is not just a pious commonplace. It is not commonplace at all. For what it means is this, among other things, that for whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death, he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine, Whatever game he is playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life 
and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money, to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty, and died in disgrace, and thought it well worthwhile. Christianity is, of course, not the only religion that has found the best explanation of human life in the idea of an incarnate and suffering God. The Egyptian Osiris died and rose again. Aeschylus, in his play The Eumenides, re reconciled man to God by the theory of a suffering Zeus. But in most theologies, the God is supposed to have suffered and died in some remote and mythical period of prehistory. The Christian story, on the other hand, starts off briskly in St. Matthew's account with a place and a date. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, St. Luke, still more practically and prosaically, pins the thing down by a reference to a piece of government finance. God, he says, was made man in the year when Caesar Augustus was taking a census in connection with a scheme of taxation. Similarly, we might date an event by saying that it took place in the year that Great Britain went off the gold standard. About 33 years later, we are informed, God was executed for being a political nuisance under Pontius Pilate, much as we might say when Mr. Joynson Hicks was Home Secretary. It is as definite and concrete as all that. Possibly we might prefer not to take this tale too seriously. There are disquieting points about it. Here we had a man of divine character walking and talking among us, and what did we find to do with him? The common people, indeed, heard him gladly. But our leading authorities in church and state considered that he talked too much and uttered too many disconcerting truths. So we bribed one of his friends to hand him over quietly to the police, and we tried him on a rather vague charge of creating a disturbance, and had him perfect, publicly flogged and hanged on the common gallows, thanking God we were rid of a knave. All this was not very creditable to us, even if he was, as many people thought and think, only a harmless, crazy preacher. But if the church is right about him, it was more discreditable still, for the man we hanged was God Almighty. So that, that is the outline of the official story, the tale of the time when God was the underdog and got beaten, when he submitted to the conditions he had laid down and became a man like the men he had made, and the men he had made broke him and killed him. This is the dogma we find so dull this terrifying drama of which God is the victim and hero. And Dorothy Sayers goes on from there. So next time, if this is dull, then what in heaven's name is worthy to be called exciting? The people who hang Christ never to do them justice accuse them of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. And on that thought, we'll go on to next time and Sayers definitely finishes her thought that this is the greatest drama ever staged, the official creed of Christendom. So I'll attach uh, a video we did on what is the question. What's the question we, we all have to face, not just Christians, the whole human race. What think ye of Christ?